I designed and manufactured execution equipment here in the United States used in the prison for executing criminals. Uh, as an expert witness, I had testified in a number of the courts in the United States and was and still am the only approved witness to testify in federal court relative to uh, execution technology and execution technology. And based on that, I was asked to be an expert witness for the court in Toronto in the trial, second trial of Ernst Zundel. Uh, in that capacity, I was given information on the alleged gas chambers at Auschwitz, Birkenau, and Majdanek. And I was sent to Poland to investigate the facilities. Uh, I investigated the three locations. I brought uh, forensic samples back, which were reviewed by a chemical lab. And the end result was that none of the facilities that I examined had any gas residue, and there would have been a great deal of gas residue based on the residue that I found in the delousing chamber. And as far as the actual facilities, none of them, in my opinion, were capable of sustaining a gas execution. It would have been a situation where you'd, it would be somebody like using their average living room to execute someone, and they'd wind up killing themselves, their family, and half the street. So essentially, uh, that's how I became involved. What you just heard was a radio interview with one Fred Leuster, famous amongst those who would deny the crimes of the Holocaust for what is referred to as the Leuster Report. The Leuster Report is a pseudoscientific document frequently touted by Holocaust deniers as evidence that no gas chambers existed for the mass extermination of the Jews. What Leuster did was take brick samples from Auschwitz without the permission of the camp, had them pulverized, and then analyzed for a chemical analysis. The report shows small traces of hydrogen cyanide compounds that it attributes to fumigation. Just like that, there seemed to be vindication. But look closer and you will see that even the strongest evidence for the claims of white nationalism fall apart. I concluded my last video with a rundown on the Mott and Bailey tactics of the alt-right. What they argue is inadequately explored in such a way that you can gauge what they believe on a topic without them ever actually explaining it in any detail. The onus is on you to debunk the claims they never explicitly make, as opposed to the burden of proof resting with them to prove their claims. Holocaust denialism is one example of just this. The problem with debunking conspiracy theories is that the people who promote those theories are engaged in a motivated reasoning to justify the spread of those theories. These people are not guided by the facts, but are motivated to apologize for their ideology in any way they can up to and including outright denial of the crimes perpetrated by the very ideas they support. Debunk one aspect of the conspiracy and the denier will hold up some other half-truth and say, what about this? Debunk that one, and the goalpost will be moved again. The Holocaust is perhaps the most well-documented mass murder in history precisely because it was so industrialized. Historians have pieced together the events of the Holocaust by comparing census data before and after the war, on the testimony of the people there, the construction of the sites themselves, the blueprints of gas chambers and crematoriums, and the Nazi documentation of their own crimes. YouTuber Kraut&T has an excellent video piecing together the crimes of the Nazis at Mauthausen, painstakingly assembled by visiting these camps and seeing the documents, and finding the historical evidence that there were people who were there, how they came to be there, and how they died. Despite Kraut's work, Naysayers in his comment section still had problems, but never come out with outright denial. The narrative disallows that. Instead, they insinuate a cover-up by saying it's an event so true that it's illegal to deny it, or simply ask questions that the average person simply would not know the answers to. The problem with dealing with Holocaust denialism, like any conspiracy, is that the layperson has neither the time nor motivation to sift through the information that the revisionist is dedicated to twisting. For example, if you think of yeah, Auschwitz, that's the thing that to keep a, in mind, though, that was a, <laughs> Auschwitz had a nice orchestra. Yeah, soccer Auschwitz team. Was a, it was a, they had a pool, they had a gym, they had a symphony orchestra. I mean, that like there's Mexicans in America that would kill for those those living conditions. I mean, come on, and their clothes were nice yeah. and pest free. There was, in fact, a pool at Auschwitz. There was, in fact, a gym at Auschwitz. There even was a symphony orchestra. Andy Worski was absolutely unprepared to challenge any of this, so what could he do but sit there and laugh at the idea of a camp so fun Mexicans want to get in? 
When presented with these facts as a layperson, you might not be armed to properly deal with the insinuation that the Holocaust was exaggerated, but in context, none of these claims are special in any way. As was said, there are some Mexicans who would have killed for those conditions. Thus, there is little reason to think that Auschwitz was used as a mass extermination center when it contained such facilities for recreational activities. At least so goes the logic. If there were sporting events, a symphony orchestra, and a swimming pool, as evidenced by these pictures, then certainly Auschwitz couldn't have been all that bad. But it was. What the Daily Show claims to be a swimming pool was developed initially as a water reservoir, with the diving boards being added later, and that swimming pool is not present at the primary death camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz was separated into three major camps, Auschwitz I, Stammlager, Auschwitz II, Birkenau, and Auschwitz III, Monowitz. The primary extermination camp was Birkenau. In 1944, the pool was built in Auschwitz I, which, at the time, was not an extermination camp. Contrary to what the talking heads at the Daily Show might believe, this pool was not designed to give Jewish prisoners a relaxing dip on a hot day, but as a backup water reservoir to firefight with. Further, the sports association was exclusive to the Germans, and was run by I.G. Farben in Monowitz, far from the site of the exterminations. The insinuation that this was some sort of a recreational activity that the camp's Jews partook in is defeated by the easily observed fact that the fencer and spectators are all uniformed in Nazi attire, with the swastika lingering behind them. There was even a symphony orchestra. This is no secret. The photograph of the symphony orchestra is literally the first thing you see upon entering the camp. The orchestra served dual purposes, one being propaganda and the other being an increase to worker productivity, Jewish and German alike. This fact was adapted for a literary and theatrical audience when a surviving member of the orchestra, Fania Fignolin, wrote of her experiences in her memoir of Auschwitz, called Playing for Time. None of these facts are in dispute, and none of them undermine the central claim that the Holocaust was a real event, carried out by the Nazis, and that it primarily targeted Jews. This argument, that because some parts of the camp were devoted to leisure, that therefore, the rest of the camp must have been as well, is infantile in its logic. There are numerous claims that flirt with this narrative that either the mass killings perpetrated by the Nazis did not happen, or that they were greatly exaggerated. There are claims of a detached chimney at the camp, as if to say that the chimney was just a show conjured up by the Soviets, but this claim ignores the fact that the blueprints showing the chimney and its connection to the crematoria are now in the historical record. Some deniers claim that the Holocaust death toll was exaggerated because the World Almanac put the Jewish population at 15 million in 1933, with the number changing relatively little in 1948. However, these numbers are derived from the American Jewish Congress's demographic data, and the data isn't the Jewish population in 1948, but the population data from 1939. The World Almanac numbers were not adjusted for the war at the time of publication. Further, the World Almanac actually had two published data sets, and the data in the second set are not sourced, making the World Almanac a useless source compared to conventional census data. An intelligent person should be able to realize that taking a census during a war as destructive and wide as World War II was likely impossible. Another denier claim is that Hitler himself never gave a written order for the extermination of the Jews, as if this somehow disproves any of the available evidence. This is not really a mystery. During the interrogation of Adolf Eichmann, when asked about the order for the extermination of the Jews, or the final solution to the Jewish question, Eichmann responded, I never saw a written order. All I know is that Heydrich said to me, the Fuhrer has ordered the physical extermination of the Jews. He said that as clearly and surely as I'm repeating it now. This narrative is further discredited in a speech by Heinrich Himmler in what is now known as the Posen speeches. In the speech on October 4th, 1943, Himmler says to the SS that, quote, I am now referring to the evacuation of the Jews the extermination of the Jewish people. It's one of those things that is easily said, the Jewish people are being exterminated, says every party member. This is very obvious, it's in our program. Elimination of the Jews, extermination, we are doing it, a small matter, end quote. And again, two days later, October 6, 1943. The Jewish question in the countries that we occupy will be solved by the end of the year. 
Only remainders of odd Jews that manage to find hiding places will be left over. End quote. Not only do the recordings of Himmler's speeches remain, but so do the transcripts, indicating that this was no off-the-cuff remark about enemies of the state, but a deliberate speech about an ongoing German program. Perhaps the most damning indictment to this idea that Hitler had no hand in the crimes of the Holocaust was a diary entry by Joseph Goebbels, dated December 12, 1941. In his diary, Goebbels writes, Regarding the Jewish question, the Fuhrer has decided to make a clean sweep. He prophesied to the Jews that if they yet again brought about a world war, they would experience their own annihilation. That was not just a phrase. The world war is here, and the annihilation of the Jews must be a necessary consequence. The next major claim is that Zyklon B was merely a delousing agent. Perhaps the strongest supporting evidence of this claim was the earlier mentioned Leuster report. The problem with Leuster's report is that it operates on a number of incorrect assumptions. For example, one such claim is that the lack of Prussian blue stains on the walls indicates that the gas chambers were not actually used for gassing, since hydrogen cyanide compounds would have to be used in such a great frequency that such staining would occur. This is untrue. Far less cyanide is needed to kill a human being than an insect, requiring much less exposure for large-scale killings. Another one of Leuster's claims is that it would take an impractical amount of hours to air out the gas chambers. This is untrue. The reason hours might be needed before re-entry and fumigation is because the greater quantity of cyanide clean stick furniture, curtains, and other forms of fabrics, whereas all the execution chambers had were concrete, flesh, and forced ventilation. Leuster's central claim that there were traces of hydrogen cyanide in the samples taken from Auschwitz consistent with fumigation is defeated by the very lab he tasked with the chemical analysis. James Roth, the manager of the lab Loyster relied upon, stated that Loyster did not indicate to him what he was looking for in the samples he provided, so the lab pulverized the samples, contaminating any evidence of hydrogen cyanide compounds. With the proper methodology introduced by the Institute of Forensic Research in Krakow, samples were again examined for hydrogen cyanide compounds. To quote them, the Institute for Forensic Research, Krakow, discriminated against Prussian blue compounds so as to not introduce a bias in the control. They found unequivocally that all buildings said to have been in contact with hydrogen cyanide compounds at Auschwitz-Birkenau had traces of cyanide significantly above the background of other buildings at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Simply put, the Leuchter Report got it wrong. Perhaps most damning to the deniers' claims is that even members of these various camps have written and testified to the mass killings and gassings there. SS doctor Johann Kramer wrote in his diary of witnessing special actions, a euphemism for gassing, written just before Kramer remarked that Auschwitz was not called a camp of annihilation for nothing. Commander Heinrich Keitel was secretly recorded by the British bragging, quote, in Upper Silesia, they simply slaughtered the people systematically. They were all gassed in a big hall. End quote. Auschwitz camp commandant Rudolf Hess wrote in his memoir while in Polish captivity that, while commandant of Auschwitz, the number of dead was 1.1 million people, based on his personal recounting of larger actions, figures he broke down by location. So how do we know that 6 million Jews perished in the Holocaust? varying methodologies. Examining pre-war census data and post-war census data is one method. Raoul Hilberg arrived at a 5.1 million estimate in his book, The Destruction of the European Jews, by this method. Lucy Davidovich wrote in her 1975 book, The War Against the Jews, that the number of dead was 5.9 million, a figure she arrived at by comparing pre-war birth and death records with post-war ones. Yad Vashim a Holocaust Research Center, maintains a named database which aims to collect the names of every Jewish victim of the Nazis, pieced together by Nazi records, diaries, documentation, and testimony from family and friends of those who died during the Holocaust, and thus far, the project has at minimum 4 million names. The Anglo-American Commission of Inquiry put the number of Jewish dead at 5.7 million, a figure they arrived at by looking at the number of missing Jews post-war, subtracted from the total number of European Jews estimated at the Wannsee Conference. 
None of these numbers are immune to being questioned. Their respective methodologies are listed, with some differing from others, and the historical consensus is between 5 and 6 million Jews with all methodologies. If one were to contest these numbers or these methodologies, it is incumbent upon them to estimate a figure of their own. Make a positive claim, then. How many Jews died, and how do you know? The deniers don't do this. There are two primary approaches the alt-right can take to this. One is that they can meme it out of existence, as a means of denying it ever happened or downplaying it. The more media-savvy ones will instead avoid addressing this issue altogether. We need only look at Richard Spencer's inability to denounce Adolf Hitler as an example of just this. Richard, we are out of time, but real quick, You're welcome. I, I heard that you, will you denounce Adolf Hitler? I heard you don't denounce Adolf Hitler when asked about that. Uh, Adolf, the National Socialism was, it was, a, it was a disaster. The 20th century was a pretty much a disaster. From yeah, but do you opinion. denounce the but actions of Adolf gonna, Hitler? I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to play this game. Oh, where it's not a game. Throw out historical figures and I denounce them. I mean, do you denounce Stalin? Do you denounce Pol Pot? I mean, look, yeah. the, the National Socialist Germany, it's part of history. It's, it's not who I am. No, I'm not, not asking if Hitler is part is. of it's history, but are. so you don't denounce Hitler when asked is what you're saying. I, I don't play this game of denunciations. Well, of but people. calling there it a game aspects. is a game. Oh, That's that a game. To call it a game. Like a game. Rejecting the actions of a genocidal madman is not difficult to do. The historical record is so expansive so as to be undeniable at this point. There was a Holocaust. It was the systematic killing of the Jews by the Nazis. We know that it was deliberate because of the testimony of the Nazis, the campsites themselves the testimony of survivors, and more. We know that between 5 and 6 million Jews perished in the Holocaust, and we know this by reconstructing the lives of those who were lost by the testimony of family, death records, diaries, more. The census data alone should dispel this idea that there was any exaggeration to these crimes. 5 to 6 million people really did perish. I compel those of you watching to observe what I'm telling you will happen. Some on the alt-right will comment that this evidence is a fabrication, that the testimony of Jews cannot be trusted, that the SS were compelled to testify under duress. They will have an explanation for any number of prosecutions against their ideology. The reason we have to be vigilant in how we discuss this extreme anti-Semitic animus is because the very ideas that caused the worst mass murder in human history appear to once again be on the rise despite all of the evidence of the crimes this ideology has done. We live in a time of anti-Jewish murders that the alt-right will apologize for. I really could go on and on about the dishonest tactics of the alt-right and the different ways in which they either apologize for their ideology or obfuscate it. I compel you to watch those who comment and see how they apologize for the worst atrocity. They will do it like clockwork, and their anti-Jewish resentment will be rebuffed with a simple observation. Six million people don't just disappear.